of all the things we're going to talk about on tonight's show, um, I didn't think me having a beef with Santos Escobar would be one of them. Did you? No, you didn't. Did you miss me? Because I'm back. Let's talk about it. What's going on, everybody? It's your buddy. It's your pals, Mass Phoenix, the YWC Rally Check, here with your May 25th NXT review. First and foremost, to all my fellow Canadians, and yes, we're going to get to that later, happy belated May 2-4. Uh, this was the May 2-4 weekend for us. We are very much still in lockdown, so other than getting out in the boat, on the water, if you guys follow me on social media, you would have seen the pictures that I took of Toronto kind of looking like it was entering the apocalypse, because it was looking pretty stormy. Other than that, a long weekend is pretty goddamn useless, is it not? But it is May 2-4 weekend nonetheless, all my fellow Canadians, happy maple syrup and whatever other cliches I can possibly pull out. Um, you guys haven't seen me in a week, and that wasn't intentional, that wasn't because I actually had one or two people reach out and be like, hey man, what's going on, there's nothing on the channel. Um, now, only being gone a week, that is, that's a nice feeling for, to a certain degree. Um... I didn't do an NXT review last week because about halfway through NXT last week I realized I was exhausted from work and that didn't happen and anything else I do in the week has to do with people that I collaborate with. Obviously uh, those of you that know Jake DeMarco know that he's he's got some stuff on the go. Uh, Guapo and I are going to hopefully sit down this week because there's AEW stuff to talk about and Flix Fix. Flix Fix has been in flux because there's been nothing Marvel related on Disney Plus. I think they're doing the Bad Batch right now, which I haven't watched. I'm not going to lie. Loki's coming soon. We will fix that eventually. We are going to do uh, Godzilla vs. Kong at some point. I don't want to say that it's going to be this weekend in case it doesn't end up being this weekend. But yeah, so no collaborations plus no NXT review means you guys haven't seen me since two weeks ago. Now, I do want to throw your attention back to two weeks ago. I did have Jake DeMarco here on the show. We did quite a fun um, fantasy booking, because it's what we do. Um, a little episode about Daniel Bryan and him supposedly leaving WWE if it's not a work. And yes, there are people still out there that think it's a work. Just who who we would like to see him face. Should he go to AEW? Should he go to Impact? Should he go to New Japan? Should he go to Destiny Wrestling? Check it off your Spaz Phoenix bucket list. Oh yes. All of those are in that video. Just a, just a little bit of a spoiler. There's uh, about, I think we came up with 10 plus um, opponents for him outside of WWE uh, with some honorable mentions thrown in. And yes, we mentioned Kenny Omega. So everybody fucking chill. Definitely in the honorable mentions though, because it's not the top of either of our lists. It's true, it's true. Uh, as I mentioned, all things being equal, I should have a predictions video for you guys for Double or Nothing. Uh, myself, Guapo, we're going to sit down, we're going to talk about the show. Haven't had Guapo on in a long time, so that'll be really good. He's really busy. He's, uh, he's like me, works kicking him in the ass, except he's moving up the ladder, so it's kicking him more in the ass. So, sh so shout out to him, and hopefully we'll get that. We will also address at that time, somewhere in that video, the news that came out recently about, um, uh, Dynamite moving to TBS, them having the second show on Fridays, what is it, Rampage? Rampage? Sure, whatever, um, but yeah, that's that's worth a whole separate discussion, uh, so we will try to, we'll try to throw that in there when we get Guapo back on the show. I may or may not throw up an episode of NXT Rewind this weekend. My initial plan was to only put up an episode of NXT Rewind before an NXT TakeOver. Now, that means you guys would only get like five a year, which is not a lot. Uh, I didn't want to make it, uh, you know, before every pay-per-view, because sometimes there's a couple weekends in a row where there is a pay-per-view, and I'm not going to lie, I don't have that many episodes of NXT Rewind in the can. I may or may not throw up the next episode of, uh, of NXT Rewind before Double or Nothing this weekend. I haven't decided yet. That's that's as honest as I can be right now. The next first one was Arrival. The second one is the actual first NXT takeover. And isn't it fun and isn't it good? And it was back when we were <coughs> excuse me. It was back when we were allowed to like Charlotte Flair. See I'm not even allowed to say it anymore. Um but yeah so that's that's the rundown on what's going on in the show to to the one or two people that said hey there's nothing on the channel for like a week what's up i do appreciate that it warms the cockles of my heart i do have one in here somewhere but uh 
I said to the people that I uh, that I collaborate with that I was going to come back hard this week. So yeah, go check out the Brian video. But hopefully, uh, predictions with Guapo this week. Maybe another episode of Flix Fix over the course of the weekend. Maybe an NXT rewind, and we will get Jake DeMarco back on the show um, when he is able. I, I'm hoping to do the next two episodes uh, of that series we were working on before. If you guys recall, we were doing a series on. Uh, wrestlers that NXT could bring in to beef up the NXT Cruiserweight division. And the work is done. The lists are made. The notes are, are, are all there. We've shared them, and we know exactly what we're going to talk about. Right now, it's just carving out the time, and the Daniel Bryan thing was more time appropriate uh, when when we did sit down to, to, to do some stuff. So, yeah, there's stuff coming on all fronts. There's NXT stuff coming. There's AEW stuff coming. There's Flix Fix stuff coming. Happy May 2-4. Gotta plug the socials. Go to Twitter, at SpazPhoenix, at SpazPhoenix1. Go to any audio platform you like and put in Sp <coughs> Spaz Phoenix Podcast. Go to YouTube, search Spaz Phoenix. Go to Facebook, search the Spaz Phoenix Podcast Facebook group. Leave me a comment there. Leave me a comment here. We are, we're, we're creeping up there, and I like it. I would love it if we were moving faster. So if you like what you see, I'm going to be as blatant as I can be. If you like what you hear, what you see, depending on where you're listening right now, and you think somebody else might like it too, give it a pass on. It's all good. Put a comment down for YouTube as well so they don't yell at me for lacking interaction. Let's talk about the show because I've been rambling for six minutes already. We start with a video package, obviously, on tonight's main event, which is Balor Cross 2 for the NXT Championship. And then the commentators at ringside run down the rest of the card for what we can expect Tonight, the debut of, of Frankie Monet, the tag team uh, match that opened the show, um, a couple other things. We're going to hear from Bronson Reed, etc. Uh, it's kind of an old school thing, but I do like that NXT has started doing doing this open where either we get a cold open and there's just a match, or you get this semi-cold open with all the announcers at ringside uh, with the billboards and everything behind them running down what you're going to see on the show. It's super simplistic, but simple things can be good. It, it's just a thing. Uh, we started off the night with uh, Shotzi, Blackheart, and Ember Moon taking on Dakota Kai and Raquel Gonzalez. Now, I, going into this match, I thought they, they've got a couple good things, or a couple of interspersed stories that you can do here, and a couple of conflicting bits of wrestling logic. Shotzi and Ember, you don't want to make them the number one contenders right off the bat, again, because they're the ones that just lost the titles. You want to bring some people new into the mix. I will say, much as I like Shotzi and Ember, you do need to get Tian Sha in there. You do need to get Cora Jade and Gigi Dolan in there. You do need to get Katanzaro and Carter in there. You do need to get uh, Aaliyah and Jesse Camilla from the Robert Stone brand in there. Not to win the title, just to give that tag team division some diversity and God be better than than Monday Night Raw. Oh, we, we didn't talk about Natty and, and Tamina being champions because I haven't talked to you guys in a while. And we missed the whole... I'm, I'm all over the map tonight, so you'll have to excuse me. I'm um, happy to be back talking to you guys, quite frankly. But... Um, we, we didn't talk much about Backlash. Uh, we, we again, uh, when Jake and I sat down and decided what we were going to talk about two weeks ago, what do you want to talk about? Uh, the Backlash rematch of WrestleMania, Backlash rematch the third, or this Daniel Bryan commentary that we did. And we decided that, and I'm, I'm happy with what we did. The Zombies, though. The Zombies, though. Everybody hated the zombie thing, right? I find it hilarious that everybody hated the zombie thing because going into that pay-per-view, nobody gave a shit about that match. It's like, oh, the, you know, the, they've already ruined Damian Priest and The Miz is just The Miz. It doesn't really matter what he does anymore. Nobody, People didn't care about that match until they had something bad to say about it, which was the zombie thing. And the zombie thing was... F it was fun. It was ridiculous. It was, don't look at this with any seriousness. Don't put this... In, don't look at this through your five, six, seven stars in the Tokyo Dome, brother, uh, glasses. It's just a bit of bullshit and a bit of fun. And apparently, for the cross-promotion for Army of the Dead, WWE got an additional million dollars. And you know what? For a million dollars, I'll go be a naked zombie in Nathan Phillips Square right now. Um, that being said, though, I think it's hilarious. Uh, it does suck that The Miz got injured. Um, that's, that's, that's not, that's not great. Uh, I have heard of a push for John Morrison, which is good, and they still seem to be pretty high on Damian Priest, which is also good. It does segue me into, I don't know whether we'll ever do a Flix Fix on this, I don't know if this is up my, uh, my co-host's, uh, street as far as content goes. I did check out Army of the Dead over the weekend, 
And I will say, without any spoilers, it is really good. I really enjoyed it. The acting in it and some of the thought that went into it is more than a zombie movie deserves, is, is the backhanded compliment that I can give this movie. I will say, the only thing I will say, the only warning I will give you guys, if you haven't seen Army of the Dead yet and you want to, it is really long. I think, I could be wrong, I think it caps in at like 2 hours 20 minutes. So, um, so uh, sit down and... and uh, what, what do you want to call it? Ch chisel out a good portion of your day if you want to watch it, but it is good. And Batista's, Batista's just fun. And uh, I found out after the fact that there's one character in that movie that was never on set, that was completely digitally inserted into the movie. Now that's awesome, and uh, I'm happy for this person that they get to be part of that neat little bit of trivia, but they're, they're, they're inserted in there because whoever they were replacing got me too and you guys know how I feel about that. So you take the salt, you take the sweet, and, and, you, and you go on with that. But go check out Army of the Dead as well. I don't know how I got onto that, if I'm completely honest. But yeah, Shotzi and Ember versus Kai and Gonzalez. Now here's here's my problem. You don't want Shotzi and Ember immediately going back into the title picture after they just lost the titles to the way and everybody else except for me is tired of Shotzi Blackheart versus Candice LeRae. I could watch that all day. But also, you don't really want to put the titles back on Kai and Gonzalez because then you run the risk of doing what they did with Sasha and Bailey on the main roster and amalgamating all the titles into one storyline, which isn't always the greatest. And you don't want to have Kai and Gonzalez, who are on a slow breakup, making Shotzi and Ember, who are still a really awesome team, look weak. Now, if you think that team's breaking up anytime soon, go uh, go hop on over to WWEshop.com and see how much Shotzi and Ember tag team merch they are releasing, like, by the day. I don't think they're breaking up that team anytime soon, and that makes my heart happy, because as much as it breaks my heart, I don't think Shotzi Blackheart is going to be in the main title picture anytime soon. Now, if I'm wrong about that, then we're going to have an entirely different kind of conversation. Shotzi and Gonzalez start. There's a face plant by Gonzalez. There's a snap head scissor by Ember Moon. They start trading some pin attempts in the early going. Slam by Gonzalez. Assisted double stomp by Kai. Obviously assisted by her tag team partner. I don't know why that needed clarification. Trip by Moon. Running elbow by Shotzi. Cloverleaf by Shotzi. And Gonzalez pulls Kai out of the ring to get her out of the Cloverleaf. The thing is about Dakota Kai being a heel and being as tiny as she is, when she's getting her comeuppance, like hanging off the end of the cloverleaf from Shotzi Blackheart, she does just look like a rat that's been hung out to dry. And I mean that in a good way. It's it's the catharsis of seeing the bad guy get their comeuppance. Um, it's, you know, the bad guy gets the cake in his face at the end of the comedy movie. It's, it's that kind of thing. Uh, shower of Elbows... Yeah, Shower of Elbows by Gonzalez takes us into the commercial break. Single leg dropkick by Moon as we come back from the commercial break. Right hands in a cyclone elbow. Top rope code breaker by Moon. Lariat by Gonzalez. Assisted GTK by Gonzalez and Kai. Lariat Inseguri boot TKO on the knee by Shotzi. All in quick succession. You'll love to see it. Top rope crossbody by Shotzi. A takedown by Gonzalez. A stunner by Moon, which they called a modified eclipse, but it was just a, it was, it was just a stunner. I, I, do, I usually cut the commentators on on NXT some slack because I do like... The, they're not the greatest. They're really not. I like Beth Phoenix. I, I like Bad News Barrett and the other guy that's there. Adnan Verk on Raw is already gone. Can we just can we just laugh at that for a second? But I'm sorry. Every time we go back and see retro Stone Cold Steve Austin stuff, is he doing a modified Eclipse? Or is it a stunner? Obviously it's a stunner. When... when when, uh, what the fuck is his name? Why can't I think tonight? When Kevin Owens does a stunner, is it a stunner or is it a modified eclipse? You do a stunner, it's a stunner. You do the top rope, never mind. Remember when I didn't know who Ember Moon was and Guapo had to sell me on the idea of Ember Moon when he just said stunner from the top rope? This wasn't from the top rope. It was just a stunner. Moving on. Slam Lariat combo by Shotzi and Moon get the win and they're the number one contenders. They will get a shot at the way once again later on down the line. Now, I do hope although I don't think they will because of things we're going to talk about later, I kind of hope that Tian Cha interrupts that and just, like, destroys everybody. And then they get a title shot, and then we finally get to see, uh, what's her name, the the thousand-year-old dragon lady, uh, Mei Ling, I think. Somebody's going to correct me down in the box below, and that'll be great, because then YouTube won't bother me about not having interaction, so everything, everything's good. Um... So yeah, that'll be that, and uh, after the match, there's a post-match assault, and it's a hell of a post-match assault, and Shotzi Blackheart is a great ragdoll, is she not? Um, Gonzalez gets her outside the ring, and she gets her in a powerbomb position, but she powerbombs her against the plexi, holds her up, powerbombs her against the post, holds her up, 
power bombs, power bombs her. I can speak, I swear. Power bombs her against the plexi again, and then snake eyes on the guardrail, on that one open piece of guardrail they have where all the cameras and all that are. The entire time Dakota Kai's got Ember Moon tied up in the corner in some way, shape, or form, just watching her friend get demolished. And there's the psychology factor of that. There's the, not only am I watching my friend get demolished and I can't do anything about it, you know, there's the built-in sympathy because they're both baby faces and, you know, they would want to help each other. And Shotzi Blackheart takes a beating like no other. Gotta fucking love it. Tommaso Ciampa and Timothy Thatcher are in the back. They address the grizzled young veterans. I didn't even really realize this. I didn't realize these guys were tied up at one apiece. And uh, Tommaso Ciampa ends it by saying he promises them there will be a round three. And then he leaves and Thatcher just kind of sticks around and goes into some growly, I can't wait to break your bones or something to that degree. I, I do like this team, but it's not for the promos. Let's talk about... Pete Dunne versus Bobby Fish. Bobby Fish completes the quartet of ex uh, Undisputed Era guys that now have generic Rock 5 music and have gone back to generic ring attire, other than the fact that his ring attire happens to have a fish on it. See what they did there. Uh, back elbow by Fish and a corner splash and a series of kicks, knee strikes, uh, knee strikes in the ropes by Fish. Dunn claws at the face. That's his first offensive move. Dunn works over the ankle and he rotates him over into some mounted punches. Both men trade some kicks. There's a headlock hip toss by Dunn. There's a boot by Fish, a grounded armbar forearms by Dunn. Uh, Fish hangs. I, th I thought it said Fish hooks because that's how shit my writing is. Fish hangs the arm over the ropes to put some extra pressure on the shoulder, on the elbow, etc. Done, and then he tosses Dunn out of the ring as we go to commercial break, and NXT rolls on. Dunn works the uh, the hand, the arm, the wrist, the elbow, that you guys know the bit. Uh, as we come back from the commercial break, a running knee strike into the guardrail by Fish, Insiguri by Dunn, and a hangman by Fish. Both people, or sorry, both um, guys, they trade some knee strikes, and they are some wicked knee strikes, I gotta say, like that, that quick pump knee strike. Uh, style. There's a snap surplex, suplex by Dunn. Dunn stomps on both the hands. There's an armbar, a finger snap, an armbar by Fish, a bitter end by Pete Dunn, and Pete Dunn gets the win. And for the second match in a row, we get a post-match assault by Lorcan. And the the save that everybody thought was so, it was so, um, what's it called, uh, telegraphed or forecast or whatever. Oh, you know, this is how they're going to get Kyle O'Reilly down there, and there's going to be a predictable tag match. Nah. Fish just got destroyed after the match. And they did this thing where they laid him out on the apron. I, I know I shouldn't do hand motions when I'm trying to explain things. But they laid him out on the apron so that his shoulder was sitting just off the edge of the apron, the hardest part of the ring, as Taz would tell you if he was still in WWE. And they just sort of step on his arm just over the edge so that the post of the maneuver is the apron, or the apron edge itself, if that makes sense. It looked really ugly. And there, it wasn't anything spectacular. It was just that little bit of something new, that little bit of something different, using the ring in a different way, and it was very, very effective. Uh, now, no doubt that either Kyle O'Reilly will try to avenge his friend at some point. He'll take on Oni Lorcan again, and they'll beat the shit out of each other again, and it'll be fine, and then we'll eventually get the tag match, and that's fine. But... In the meantime, uh, Bobby Fish, making his return after, what was it, like six months, uh, was out there on his own, making a showing of himself on his own. And that that's better than, you know, having somebody that's been around the whole time and, like, had flirtations with the main event scene, like Kyle O'Reilly, just sort of, you know, casually and friendly, like, putting the armor around the shoulder. And, oh, come on, welcome back, buddy, let me take care of you. That wouldn't have done him any favors in this case. He... He d he looks better, in my opinion, in this particular case, for just being the guy that got badly done by, the guy that got double teamed, the guy that took the that came back from his injuries ridiculously early as well, you know, aka John Cena, um, and just took the beating. I think there's something in that that makes him look better than if Kyle had come to to save him. We see hi highlights of. Uh, Bronson Reed winning the championship last week, which I didn't talk about, but Bronson Reed is the new North American champion. They could have done that at uh, at TakeOver. It would have been better. But I, I did say that there would be a shuffle. I said he would get the North American championship. Other people would line up to face uh, to face him that were maybe going for the Cruiserweight championship before, and this does. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cling to this because if I cling to stuff long enough, eventually it happens. Bronson Reed. Um you know, won ladder matches and then lost title matches and won gauntlet matches and then lost title matches and then eventually became North American champion. So I'm going to stick to my guns here and say that at some point, Gargano and Theory are going to pick up the tag team titles. 
and they're going to be the first faction to be a tag team of tag team championship holders for for tag team. Why is the light going out? Why is that a thing? That doesn't need to be a thing at all. Anyways, so yeah, got lost in my thoughts all kinds on that. Anyways, yeah, the uh, the Bronson Reed match, the the cage match with Gargano was really good. Gargano knows exactly what he needs to do to get Bronson Reed over. He's the little guy. Bronson Reed's the big guy. He's the face. He, Gargano just needs to look like he's worried about getting destroyed, and he did that to magnificent, uh, magnificent uh, levels. The one thing I did like, and it's the one spot in the cage that sticks out to me more than the finish, is where Bronson was kind of against the cage. And this, we're going back to last week. I know. Bear with me for a second. Where he's up against the cage, and. Gargano struck him from one direction, but Theory struck him from outside the cage, so that even though Theory couldn't get in the cage to help Gargano, they still did a double team maneuver. I think that's really cool. And again, it doesn't have to like break the break the wheel. You don't have to reinvent the machine. Just something a little bit different like that will stick out, like we talked about with the only Lorcan arm spot a second ago. Mercedes Martinez um, sort of gives credit to Gonzalez, says, you know. She didn't win her match with Gonzalez, but she learned a lot, and now she's on the road back to the title. And as she's walking away, you see somebody's lurking around in the background, being a lurker, and uh, keeping an eye on Mercedes Martinez, and it's Boa. What could that mean? What could that possibly mean? And then Hit Row cut a promo. I don't know what you want me to, to say. Like, I am not, I am not the right person to reiterate a Hit Row promo. But basically, they called out every champion or potential champion on the roster. They started with Cross and Balor, then they went to MSK and Legato. They called out Kushida, and they called out the brand new champion, Bronson Reed. Now, they mentioned the tag titles at one point, which obviously, uh, what's his name, Top Dollar and Ashanti the Adonis would be that. And then, obviously, Swerve would go for some sort of singles gold. But then they mentioned the, the Cruiserweight Championship, and Ashanti... You know, raised up his you know raised up his head, and and they focused on him for a second. Now, again, like I said with the women, if you're gonna put the tag titles on Ashanti the Adonis and Top Dollar, don't then also put the cruiserweight championship on Ashanti, because it'll do the same thing. Then you soak up all the. Uh, I don't mind every person in a faction having a title, but you don't need to have two people in that faction, or sorry, one person in that faction holding two titles, because then the title pitchers, it, it's not, that's not the same as what Undisputed Era did, for example, because they all had titles, but they all went off separately and defended them. If you're the Cruiserweight Championship, or the Cruiserweight Championship holder, rather, and you're defending the Cruiserweight Championship at a takeover, then potentially the tag team titles are not being defended at that takeover, and vice versa. Um... I don't know, Cross Balor, MSK, Legato, Kushida, Bronson Reed just come into the recording studio and kick the shit out of them. They did not mention any of the women's division. So I don't know if, uh, what what the hell's her, her gimmick name, B-Fab? I don't know if she's going into the women's division or if she's in, in more of a... Uh, well, I can't, I think, tonight. Sorry, guys, getting back in the groove. Um, a valet. I don't know if she's in more of a valet role or whether she is a wrestler or whether they're, they're going to introduce her as a wrestler later on down the line. I would hate to see her fall foul of the same things that happened to Alexa Bliss when she was stuck managing other people, when Nikki Cross was just like the crazy friend of Sanity and didn't really get a push that she deserved. I hope that doesn't happen to her. If she can wrestle, let her wrestle. If all your other guys in, in, your, in your group are wrestling, let the one... Anyways, you guys know what I mean. I don't need to ramble on this one forever and ever and ever. Mercedes Martinez versus Zayda Ramir. And I, I mean, respect is always to Mercedes Martinez because she's a badass. I would definitely sit down and have a drink with Mercedes Martinez because she's probably got some wicked stories to tell. And she's pretty deadly to watch in the ring. But Zayda Ramir is a lot of fun. We've got this layer. We've got this layer of, of female talent that's in right now. And you've heard me talk about Cora Jade, Gigi Dolan. You know I want higher things for Shotzi Blackheart. We've got Aaliyah and Jesse Camilla down with the Robert Stone brand doing their thing. Um, Zeta Ramir, Zoe Stark, uh, you know, Frankie Monet, who we're going to talk about in a second, Saray. We have this bubbling new layer of an already stacked roster. Um, and yes, people come... Uh, people that I talk to about the women's division and they're like, oh, well, you know, you wanted like super problematic Tessa Blanchard to come over to NXT and, and join the roster there and boost it up. Well, look at the size of the roster. Do you still want Tessa Blanchard? Yes. You know why? 
because more is more. If you want to show me how great this women's division is, and then you want to put a hat on top of a hat, I'm okay with that. I really am. Now, are they... I don't know why this became a Tessa Blanchard rant all of a sudden. Are they doing just fine without Tessa Blanchard? Yes, obviously. What I've also advocated is three people to come back to NXT that are being absolutely wasted on the main roster. And I don't mean wasted as in they're not winning right now or they're not in the place I want them to be right now. I mean literally wasted. Nikki Cross, Liv Morgan, and uh, and uh, Ruby Riot. Why? For a couple of reasons. Nikki Cross never got a run. Uh, the Riot Squad existed at a time where there wasn't a women's tag team championship. So let them go for the tag title shots. N maybe not necessarily Nikki Cross getting a title shot, but maybe letting her have some kind of singles run, have a couple of feuds, or you bring those three and you team them up with Shotzi and Ember and you have a kick-ass five-woman punk rock faction and tell me that wouldn't kick ass. And then you do then you do the Spirit Squad slash Freebird slash New Day rule and the five of them become NXT Women's Tag Team Champions because I've clearly not had enough sleep. Anyways, my point of all that, Zeta Amir is awesome. She got that fluke victory with the Shooting Star Press over uh, Tony Storm and, and I fell in love because that's what I do. But even against Mart Martinez, who's like a beast compared to her, she held her own in what is obviously a squash and obviously a match destined to make Martinez look good. It's fine. Uh, collar and elbow tie and a front face lock by Martinez, an arm drag and a drop kick by Ramir, forearms and a lariat, rolling elbow by Martinez, rolling butterfly suplexes by Mercedes Martinez are fucking gorgeous. Dragon sleeper by Martinez, a spine buster and some forearms, a head scissor by Ramir, a corner splash by Martinez, a toss off the ropes by Martinez, a knee and an air raid crash get a quick win from Mercedes Martinez, but I still do think that they're doing some cool things with Zeta Ramir. I think they're, they're getting around to being good at presenting new people, but... That's not the story. As much as I would love Zeta Ramir to be the story, Zeta Ramir is not the story. The lights go out, and they cut off Mercedes Martinez's music. The Tian Sha music comes on. Nobody comes out. Lots of spooky, lots of ambiance, lots of weird lighting and smoke and all that sort of thing. And if you remember that that ashy pattern that they drew on, uh, on Zia Lee's hand before they kidnapped her, um, that symbol appeared on the on the side tron like if you're looking at like the entranceway is over here but then they got the side tron that's on the hard cam side that symbol sort of appear i don't know what that symbol is supposed to be let me be clear but it appeared on the screen and then it went away went back to being her music went back to celebrating her victory now i didn't see this because i must have looked away from the tv for a split second but apparently she looks at her hand and the that symbol somehow magically appeared on her hand obviously a stage hand came while the lights were out and drew it on her hand that's fine but she's been marked now, one of two things is going to happen. That means either she's being recruited by Tian Sha, which means the tag team of Tian Sha is going to be Zia Lee and Mercedes Martinez, which is awesome and a really big problem for anybody who has those tag team titles, or she's the next one that they're targeting, and we're going to get Zia Lee versus Mercedes Martinez, which I am very, very okay with. I am very, very okay with these two kick-ass women going into that ring and beating the absolute holy hell out of each other, because either way it works. Now, we cut to the back, Million Dollar Man is in the back because he's going to have the Million Dollar face-off in a second, but he's interacting with a couple people backstage, and you know, conveniently they're all heels, Tony Storm's back there, the Robert Stone brand's there, etc. Now, I'm going to breeze through the Million Dollar face-off because this is not my cup of tea. Now what I very much expect, I had a whole ramble here, I had a whole ramble here, and I was going to compare this segment to what it's like for me currently living in the area of Canada that I live in, right? Because I thought this was going to be Million Dollar Man taking Grimes under his wing, presenting him with the Million Dollar Championship, which has been rumored over and over and over again, and it was going to be corny as hell, but for the people that it works for, it works. There's people that are into Cameron Grimes. It's not my cup of tea, as you guys have heard me say a bunch of times. Now, I was going to say that here in Ontario, we are very, very slowly unlocking in like a couple of weeks. And very slowly is like, okay, you can go to the park. Okay, you can take your kids to the splash pad. Okay, we're gonna open up the basketball courts and whatever. Now, for me, that doesn't do anything for me. Because what are the things that I like to do? I like to go to the bar. Uh, if you wanna have a really good laugh, I like to go to the karaoke bar. Um, I like going to the theaters. If you guys haven't gotten that out of your head at this point, I like going to concerts. I like going to shows. These are all indoor things. These are the last things that are going to open 
as far as our, our lockdown here in Ontario. Now, I'm not going to get into the political conversation of that. My point is that for, the, for at least the first little while, everything that I hear opening up is going to be me being happy for somebody else, right? Golf course is going to open. I'm going to think about all my friends that like golf, and I'll be happy for them. If the, I don't know, like I say, the basketball courts open up, my friends that like basketball, I'll be happy for them. If the splash pads open up, if my friends that have kids are going to take their kids to the splash pad, I can be happy for them. It's not going to be for me for a while. And that's fine. That's cool. I can, I can, I can live on being happy for other people for a while. It was going to be the same thing here. If the Million Dollar Man Cameron Grimes thing had come to fruition... The way we thought it was, he wasn't really picking on Cameron Grimes. He really just wanted to mentor him. He wanted to bring him the Million Dollar Championship, which has been rumored forever, and that was going to be Grimes' shtick going forward. It would continue to not really be my thing. It would continue to not really be up my street. It would continue to be something that I think jumped the shark a whole long time ago. But I know that there's enough people that like it that I could have been happy for them. But we didn't even get that. What we got was Grimes coming out, and before he can even say anything, Million Dollar Man comes out. Grimes sits there sounding all sad. He's like, oh, but you don't know that I wasn't always rich. You know, I used to, you know, be a regular guy and I just hit it rich just recently and whatever. Million Dollar Man comes out and cuts like not even a heel promo. He's like, you know, you're a lot like me. You know, you remind me of me when I was a kid. And he sort of puts him over. He's like, but, you know, you want to be the next Million Dollar Man, carry the Million Dollar Legacy. They keep on saying the Million Dollar Legacy, whereas it's just, you're the next rich guy. Now, I've been one to say all along, whether it's TV, whether it's movies, whether it's wrestling, being rich doesn't automatically make you a bad guy. Being successful doesn't automatically make you a bad guy. The whole idea of the Million Dollar Man at its core is really, really flawed. But, um, but it's just like they weren't even being heels. And then they were interrupted by L.A. Knight, of all people. And he wants to be the million dollar guy. And Million Dollar Man puts him over too. And Grimes gets kind of serious. And, you know, this was supposed to be about us. And he gets in his face and he does the to the moon thing. But he's just like, I'm going to take you to the moon. And he gets serious. And L.A. Knight face plants him. And Ted DiBiase laughs at him. What did what did this do for anybody? What did it do to add L.A. Knight? What did it do for... Well, I mean, it doesn't have to do anything for Million Dollar Man, but what did it do for Cameron Grimes? What was this? The Even the people that this is... This seems to be for, I don't think are happy with how this went because it, was, it wasn't really, really good. It wasn't really, really funny, laugh out loud, bust your gut, pop everybody. It wasn't so bad I can make fun of it. It was just nothing. And that's worse. Being nothing is worse than being bad. If you're if you're bad, I can at least have some fun. Look at the zombies. We talked about the zombies earlier. It's fine. This is just nothing. And then Indy Hartwell is in the back and she's looking for Dexter because the world hated me for this 10 minute period or so. She's looking for Dexter because they can get back together because he, do, he really didn't send the flowers last week and she called him a loser while she was getting a facial, ha ha ha, facial jokes. Um... She sort of runs through the taping of the Ever Eyes Live. I like the Ever Eyes guys. They they ask her if she she's got a problem. You want to take a swing at me? The Ever Eyes guys are are great, but I want them to actually do something. And then Drake Maverick of all people is like, yeah, I, last time I saw him, he was over there in that room, and she walks into a room that's got a whole bunch of emo pictures on the wall of him stabbing himself in the heart and her calling him a loser. I like the way. I really do. I like all four members of the way you're allowed to like Austin Theory, just putting it out there. Get, get get Dexter Loomis away from the way. Just stop. Stop trying to make Dexter Loomis a thing. He's never going to be a thing. <laughs> Anyways, Frankie Monet versus Cora Jade, and Jesus Christ, I didn't, I hadn't, I'd heard, I'd seen, fuck me. It's one of those nights where I can't speak, guys. I really do apologize, but I'm not recording this again. I had seen Taya Valkyrie briefly in Impact in her last sort of days there. I knew she was a good wrestler. I couldn't remember much about how she wrestled, to be perfectly, perfectly honest with you. But I was really, I was more in interested in the character of this. And holy crap, the entrance, the sparkling lights that make it look like it's almost snowing, her coming out in like a ring gown thing that looks like more extravagant than a wedding gown and, and uh, 
all that type of thing. And the fact that they show her backstage handing off her dog to an attendant before she even comes up to the ring. It's all very good. It's all very, look how, look what a big deal I am. Just so happened that John Morrison was tweeting along with NXT tonight. That was a nice touch. But uh, she's facing Cora Jade, who I would love to see do some stuff. But um, at the moment, her and Gigi Dolan are sort of the designated jobbers. But at least they get on TV, so that's fine. Um, like I said, the, the the ring gear is is fantastic. The entrance was great. You could tell she's like totally comfortable in her skin, which is really good. Like this entrance is obnoxious, and I'm going to be as obnoxious as this entrance is, and that's always good. Color number type and a face buster by Frankie. A pump kick by Jade. A mud hole by Frankie, and some chops. Jade eats the turnbuckle. There's a series of double knees by Frankie to the front and the back, which is which is not going get you this way. Get you this way. It's good. Chops by Frankie. A knee shot and a heavy lariat. Forearm by Jade. A leg sweep and a spear. Check this out. Here are her succession of finishing moves. Frankie Monet hits a spear, hits a snap, uh, yeah, a snap twisting power bomb, and then, and Beth Phoenix popped for it on commentary. She hit her with the implant buster for the win. Is NXT gonna call it the implant buster? Absolutely not. But it's still fun. Grizzled Young veterans are in the back. Uh, they say they're done with Thatcher and Champa, so they don't know why they were cutting a promo earlier saying that there's going to be a round three. There's definitely not going to be a round three because we're done with you. We are not done with MSK. We will be watching the title match next week. More on that to come. We go to another video package, some more media reaction to Reed winning the North American Championship. Uh, I think they showed him... They, they did the typical, like, radio host thing. Oh, what would you tell young kids that are aspiring to do what you do? Well, try hard and eat your vitamins and say your prayers. Oh, wait, we can't say that anymore because somebody we're not supposed to like used to say that back in the day. Bronson then comes out to the ring, talks about the 14 years it took to get here. It wasn't very easy. It was full of falling down and picking myself back up. People told me, no, this proves them wrong. Uh, good luck trying to take it because I climbed a mountain and you guys will have to climb a colossus or something to that effect. Interrupted by Legado del Fantasma, specifically, uh, specifically Santos Escobar. Mocking him for his happy story, talking about how they bring a tear to his eye, they're doing the sarcastic golf clap, whatever. He says, I can't relate to any of that struggle. I was born a champion. I'm the emperor of Lucha Libre, and I run the bingo. Now, this has been a thing for a while. He says it, and Wade Barrett pumps it up on commentary. What does that actually mean? And, I, and I'm not trying to be stupid here. Is that just something that he's thrown into his 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 lingo when he's doing a promo or does that have a meaning I run the bingo because I don't think it means he literally runs the bingo he's not sitting there with a dabber calling B5 and N27 and all that kind of thing I run the bingo now I get what the implication is I do but it's it's very strange I don't get it it's like when people say they're out of spoons people have tried to explain the spoon thing to me a while ago too I don't get the spoon thing I don't get the I run the bingo it's fine he says what you got on the shoulder there is the North American Championship and and uh, you know Bronson Reed being Australian is, is a nice touch and he says as far as I'm concerned the North American Championship represents the US US and Mexico and then Joaquin Wilde turns to him and cuts him off and says well what about Canada and he turns to him and this man says we already decided Canada doesn't count <laughs> uh, it, this man said Canada doesn't count <laughs> it was one of those, for a split second, I, was, I turned my head and I was like, what? But at the same time, it was like the best pop I got all night. It really, really was. It was like every single joke Shawn Michaels ever told when he, whenever he was fighting Bret Hart. Um, and I popped for it in the same way that I popped. You guys have heard me tell this story before. I'm going to tell another story about Destiny. Check it off your Spass Phoenix bucket list twice. Oh, yes. Uh, the first time I ever went and saw Shotzi Blackheart, cheap plug, um... I got a Shotzi Blackheart t-shirt. You guys have probably seen me in it before. It's obnoxiously neon green. It's fine. Now, you guys know that have been following me for a long time. My whole thing is you buy a shirt at one show, you wear that shirt to the next show. Um, when I went to the next show, she was there again, and she was taking on a, a wrestler named Silesia Sparks, who's awesome, who I got to chat up uh, a couple of different times. Uh, but because she was facing Shotzi Blackheart that night, it was a Shotzi Blackheart t-shirt, I got a full promo cut on me in the merchandise stand, 
and I was like, this is this is fucking great. This is better than an autograph. This is better than a than a photo op or whatever. You, you get a promo cut on you, you're good. It's like the people that have had uh, MJF or somebody like Chris Jericho or, or or JBL or somebody cut a promo on them. This was like that, and it got a pop out of me. It's that it's that uh, self deprecating audience, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, tell me tell me I'm a piece of shit, right? Legato here. I thought we already decided Canada doesn't count. I popped. I shouldn't have popped because that's terrible. But it is what it is. And as they surround the ring, he says, I'm going to take what's mine. Before they can even commence or attempt commencing a three-on-one beatdown, the, the obvious save is made by MSK. They chuck him out of the ring. There's a double super kick spot. A little bit better than the Bucks. It's fine. Um... And then one of them ate shit from uh, Bronson Reed, which is fine. Uh, we go to the commercial break. We come back and we got Regal, who, first of all, reminds us about the Tag Team Championship match next week between Legato del Fantasma and MSK, which is going to be fucking phenomenal, and announces the triple threat match that we're getting next week. Kyle O'Reilly versus Pete Dunn versus Johnny Gargano. Winner to get an NXT Championship shot at NXT TakeOver in your house. Next week's going to be really good, guys. I do like, and, I, and uh, I've said it to people in passing, I don't know whether I've, I've actually made a point of mentioning it on a video. I do like the fact that NXT has gotten back into sort of the three-week cycle. On any given week, you can be watching NXT, and you know what's happening the next two weeks. I know that's a big plus that, uh, that AEW has, or AEW fans say that they have. By the end of, by the end of one week, you know what the entire next week is going to look like. I don't need to know the whole show. And that's where I disagree with the, the... I'm not even taking the piss out of AEW. I'm just using this as the example. This is where I disagree with the AEW philosophy. Ba basically, before the main event of every show, they give you the entire card of the next week's show. I don't want to know the whole card. If that, Does that make sense? I do want something to be... I do, I do want something to come out down the ramp that I wasn't expecting. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Now, Give me Cross Balor 2 and the debut of Frankie Monet and Pete Dunne versus Bobby Fish. That's three things I can look forward to on a two-hour show. That's something that could potentially begin, mid, and end the night. Give me the filler. Don't tell me what the filler's going to be. The other filler could be something equally great. It could be a development in an equally great story. But just don't, don't tell me the names of all the chapters before I read the book next week. But I do think NXT does have to improve giving you something to look forward to next week so now we know and i know i usually do this at the end of the podcast but i'm just going to do it here because i'm already doing it o'reilly versus dunn versus gargano i'm pretty sure it's going to be pretty sure it's going to be gargano legato del fantasma versus msk i really don't know i want to say msk only because i think the next challengers are going to be grizzled young veterans and i think he legato versus uh grizzled young veterans is a weird match not a bad match. Pretty sure the talent is there in the ring to have a great match. Uh, just the dynamic of it is weird. Uh, I do think O'Reilly and Dunn are going to take each other out, and Gargano's going to get the fluke win. He's going to have some help from Austin Theory. Uh, everything, everything stacks up in that match for it to be a Gargano win, because O'Reilly and Dunn have issues. Um, what's his name? Uh, Oni Lorcan can come fuck with O'Reilly. Bobby Fish can come for his revenge against Dunn. All four of those guys can take each other out, and Gargano has the additional help of Theory and the rest of the way. That lines it up perfectly for Gargano to get get all hopped up on his own juices and think that he's going to take on Karrion Cross and then get slaughtered at In Your House. Because I'm sorry, that's what it's going to be. Any one of these guys, and I hate, I'd hate to see it for O'Reilly or Dunn again, because they've tried and failed, tried and failed, tried and failed, tried and failed. Um, Gargano, in the, in, in the spot that he's in right now, after a lengthy North American Championship title run, because he's already got a gimmick with the way that is holding him a spot on the card anyway, and because of the type of comedic character he is, he can definitely afford to get slaughtered by Karrion Cross at TakeOver, so it makes the most sense. Now... Either, either or the other two, and you're just going to get a really good match. Eventually, I want to see O'Reilly versus Cross. I really do. But not right now, because right now, Cross isn't losing that belt. Spoiler, he won the main event. Um, kicks by Balor to start, and we, we went right into Cross and Balor, and it's fine. And uh, what's her name? Scarlet had what looked like black fingers painted on her face, which is which is lovely. People were speculating that we were going to get the Demon Balor tonight. Let me, just, let me just tell you for a second. We haven't had Demon Balor for the last couple of takeovers. We're not getting Demon Balor on a weekly episode of NXT, even though 
It was a really important match, even though it was a rematch, even though it was that typical, oh, I couldn't beat him as myself, I need to bring something else to the table. I get that. I get that that's the logic of the Finn Balor demon character. I do. And, and there's some logic to that. I'm not shitting in people's cornflakes here, but we're not going to get that on a weekly episode of NXT when we haven't had it on TakeOver in forever. I don't... I think he literally said he wants to distance himself from the from the demon until it's been gone long enough to be special again. Anyways, kicks by Balor to start in a side headlock, a tackle by cross, a forearm by Balor, and another headlock, and a toss taking us to commercial break. Almost immediately, coming back from the commercial break, armbar by Balor, shot to the head by cross, a float over into an abdominal stretch by Balor, and uh, eh. I can speak, I swear. Elbow drop to the back, gut shot by Balor, working over the arm and the ribs at the same time. So basically everything in here, as soon as you raise your arm, everything, everything, shoulder, arm, ribs, sort of like watching a Pete Dunne match, not going to lie. Snap German suplex by Balor, Balor locks in a cross face, double stomp by Balor, corner chops and a toss by cross. That rhymes, did you notice that? Balor traps cross in the apron and hits him in the face with a penalty kick as we go to another commercial break. Two commercial breaks in a main event world championship match. Way too many. Space that shit out differently. I'm going to side with the people that criticize NXT on that one. Inverted sling blade by Balor as we come back from the commercial break. Another double stop, a cross jacket by Cross, and he beats Balor against the plexi, and he power bombs him into the plexi, and he throws him back into the ring. DDT out of nowhere by Balor, followed by a sling blade and a clothesline back out of the ring. Suicide sent on by Balor and a bomb into the desk by Cross. Double stomp, drop kick, coup de gras misses. Suplex by Cross, followed by, Sa by a Saito and an abdominal stretch by Balor once again. Again, working the arm, the ribs, the midsection. It's good. Cross beats him in the head. Balor reverses, beating him in the head with the, with the, with the forearm shots to the back. You know, a little bit of the old, uh, what is Spaz love? Anything you can do, I can do better. It's good. Uh, sleeper and a leg lace by Balor. A triangle choke. They sold me. Okay, because I'm a moron. You guys know. You guys have been watching me long enough. It's been years now. You guys have been watching me. You guys know I'm a moron. It's fine. They had me for a split second with the triangle choke. They had me for a split second with the triangle choke, and I figured for a split... Like, you know when you have, like, a bunch of thoughts in just one split second? In the triangle choke, the way that Cross was selling it, I'm like, wait a minute. Are they going to put the belt on Balor, and the match at TakeOver is going to be, like, Gargano, Balor, Cross? <laughs> Which would be fun, but Cross would kill both of them. It's fine. Anyways, um... One arm power bomb by Cross out of the triangle choke shook me out of all of those delusions. A lariat, two hidden blades, stomps to the head, and a choke takes out Balor. Cross gets the win. No interference, no post match um, beatdown, no post match aggression whatsoever. Balor just sort of like awkwardly rolls out of the ring as Cross and Scarlet pose and get ready for takeover. This was. This was, a, I, I'm, I'm going to say what I said a couple weeks ago. There was another Imperium promo somewhere in there. It was, it was um, Walter making reference to the fact that they kicked the shit out of Alexander Wolf and kicked him out of Imperium because in real life he got fired. That's cool, isn't it? No, no, it's not. And Drake Wirtz, Drake Wirtz, my referee, my boy, got uh, not allowed to have honest opinions, I guess, in, in wrestling or anywhere else. Drake Wirtz is gone, too. It's fine. Uh, but Alexander Wolf, uh, randomly out of nowhere, like the day after they kicked the shit out of him and kicked him out of Imperium, we found out he was literally released from the company. That's pretty shit. Um, but yeah, so they did a whole thing. And then Walter was like basically berating uh, Marcel Barthel, Fabian Eichner for losing the belts to Breezango of all people and how they were like funny showmen and we are here to, to defend the mat and the mat is sacred and all that kind of crap. Uh, I don't care about Imperium. I don't. I really, really don't, and I don't care about, I didn't care about the Grimes and Million Dollar Man stuff before, and even for the people that are enjoying that particular story, I think they shit the bed with it tonight. Other than that, this has been great. A whole lot of women's wrestling, because NXT's women's uh, division is killing it. We are going to find Cross a semi-new challenger next week. We're going to get some pretty kick-ass tag team wrestling next week. Uh, my girls our number one contenders again for the Women's Tag Team Championships, even though Shotzi's going to have to put herself back together after being ragdolled around uh, the CWC. So there is a lot of cool stuff happening. Like I said, there's that simmering like new layer of, of the women's division that's existing underneath. Tian Sha is going to do something with Mercedes Martinez. That's that's interesting. There's a couple, like, like I outlo outlined before, there's a couple different ways they could go with that. Um... 
I don't know what else to say because this is where I would usually say, hey guys, look what we have to look forward to next week, but we've already done that. So I'm going to stop rambling and stop making up new shit to say because I've been talking for almost an hour. I'm going to say instead, I really enjoyed this show. I hope you really enjoyed this review. I've been Spaz, your YWC Reality Check. Subscribe up there. Talk down there. Start a conversation. Keep all these conversations going. Don't be a stranger. I will talk to each and every last one of you later, but for right now, tag it out. Bye, guys.